You ready, Dan? Yeah. All right, I'm Seth. And I'm Dan. We're promoting our new game, Metal Shell Neon Pulse. We're here talking with uh, Bam and Drac on Bamster's Rated R Podcast. Hello, guys, and welcome. Welcome to this week's episode. Yes, Drac and myself are just going to go ahead and talk about random things. Yes, guys, Drac has joined me. Drac, say hi. Well, that is what the R stands for, or at least so I was told anyway, in Rated R. We're not actually Rated R like hide your kids' ears and stuff like that, but um, yeah, Wait, stick what? around. What? Stick, stick through the nonsense, and then uh, afterwards stick around for our interview with uh, developers from Metal Shell. Cool-looking, futuristic, sci-fi, side-scrolling, shoot em up. Whatever you do, Drac, please, please find the Double Jeopardy theme tune and put it in as one of the um, interstitials. Please. Yeah, it's some game releasing on Steam, and uh, it says it's coming out May 17th, and it's basically a bunch of guys in, like, ponchos and sombreros, like, shooting food at each other, so it's like, they call it, like, a Mexican food fight. Like, dude, they missed out on the mark on this. They should have released it on May 5th. <laughs> Why May 5th? Well, you know, at least here in the U.S., thanks to uh, beer companies and whatnot, uh, Cinco de Mayo, or Cinco de Drinco, as I like to call it, is a, uh, a large drinking celebratory uh, holiday, kind of like St. Patrick's Day, but for, like, Mexican stuff. Um, I don't know why the... Uh, somewhere along the way, I don't know if it was the beer companies or who was trying to, to say it was celebrating Mexican independence, but I think that's actually in September. Um, but this is actually in celebration of the Battle of Puebla. But they're trying to make it to be bigger than that because they wanted to sell more beer, I think. Believe it or not, there is a patron saint of beer. You won't That's the saint that I need a medallion for. <laughs> tell you what, I tell you what, his name is Saint Arnold. No, no, you pronounced that wrong. It's Arnold. <laughs> it's, uh, it's Arnold. Get to the cha- get to the beer chapa. No, no, no. I, I can't do a, a, an Austrian accent. I really can't. I try, but I, I'm terrible at it. He's the patron I can do a saint of, of. I think it's hot pepper or something. I, the reason why I, I know this is because when we had that guy from it wasn't Poland. It was Hungary. I think it was and. I, I did a bit of a I, I did a bit of a thing on um, on a Destiny video we did, and you know Radagast came up. I'm like, oh Radagast, patron saint of beer. Fuck yeah, I'll worship that god. And obviously because of that, you know, patron saint of beer or hot pickers came. You know, honored. Get to the beer now. Do it. Do it now. Get to the brewery. Get to the brewery. And you know what the problem is? You know what the bit that bugs me the most about it? And I haven't told G because G would just ego inflate, ego inflate, head not fit through door mode is, um, he's Belgium. <laughs> but G's not Belgian. I, I know, but he lives in Belgium and he loves everything Belgium. We all know this. He also loves everything Apple. I know what you're trying to do. <laughs> what, what? I'm trying to railroad G? Oh, yes. What an idiot. He buys a closed system. Apple. And then it breaks, and it's going to cost him ninety pounds to fix a charger. <laughs> I know what you're trying to do. No, you, to do? you don't want me to start on an Apple rant. Go, 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 not, go, go. Please, it's not going to end please, well. Please. Listen, dude, seriously, as, as as I'm pretty sure you're aware, I've been absent from the internet and the world of the online for the best part of a month and a half almost. I've been playing catch up since, and the best way to catch up is to listen to people rants about it. You know. Um, uh, what does armored skeptic and, and then people like that just 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 listen to what they've been going on about and i asked you a question this last week is what the fucking hell is a bully hunter i've i've come online and this what, what? i know i know i'm way out the loop and i'm late to the party but holy shit seriously it was all a complete fraud the whole thing because I wanted the monies. You give me the monies because I is woman. Anyway, you Apple rent. <laughs> Apple rent. iPhone 10 is now a grand. Yay! F that. <laughs> oh, I, c- I can dig this. I can dig it in a bit more. I can dig it in a bit more if you want me to. I can twist the blade. Just twist the blade. <laughs> I believe it's or not, right? I- I've got myself a, um, a, pic- a pixel. All right. That thing's dead. I killed it, I broke it, it's dead. I'm not buying another one until my contract expires. I can barely use it, right? But I'm not going to go buy I love my pixel. Oh, dude, I love them. Great phones. Great, great phones. A bit the pricey, but, you know, good phone and nothing. Um, I'm actually going to go to Sony and get the XA2. 
I could I could get the XA1 because it's almost the same damn phone. Okay, it's a bit more not upgrady like the XA2, which is replacing it. But essentially, it, this is what I needed to do. It's a decent sized phone, and it will last me a year with the contract. Ta da! I don't need. Well, you say it's a bit 10. pricey, but that was part of my Apple rant, dude. Was the fact that the, because they priced their shit so goddamn expensive. Why? I'd probably have to bleep bleepity bleep bleep all of that. But anyway. Why? Yeah, I, I don't know. I still blame Apple for for how much the cell phone prices are, and I'm sure that that's only part of it. But I bet they could have been priced a lot less. Um, but anyway, aside from that, how's the camera on that one? Just I ask because I've actually been really happy with the camera on my Pixel. Uh, camera on my Pixel is great. It is no, not brilliant. on your Pixel, on the one that you're gonna get. Oh, it's it's, it's a Sony Cole Zeiss lens or Cole Zeiss lens. I haven't pronounced it right. So it's, I think it's like 32 mega 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 or whatever have you want to call it. So it, it's, the, uh... it's a camera, bro. What, you know what are Sony? What are Sony known for? Cameras. You know, so essentially it's a phone <laughs> with a camera. And that's the way my brain's thinking it is whether I get the phone or not I mean I've seen some reviews online you know Android um, Android Forever or something do some reviews on it and the phone looks solid and you know the, 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 the pixel I've got I mean don't get me wrong I got the, the smaller pixel because you know I'm not made of freaking money but I'd yeah. love to be I'd love to be but you know it was what I needed and what I wanted and I got it um, the, the, the camera's good I, I like the camera um, well, as far as the lens goes with the guy's name, how do you spell the last name? Is it I first or E first? There is a common misconception of I before E except after C, and that is completely false. I think No, like that's four. not what I'm getting at. No, no, hang, on. I'm, uh, hang on, hang on, hang on. I before E except after C is completely false. There's like four letters in the entire English language that have that I before E nonsense, right? Um, so it's Z-E-I-S-S, -S, I think. Then it should be Zeiss. And, and the reason I, I say Zeiss. that... and. Yeah, and I and and any of our German listeners, or especially even feel free if you hear this to correct me, but from the way that my last name, my actual last name, is spelled and sounds, uh, in addition to some of the time I spent in Germany as a kid, from what I remember, if I remember correctly, in the I E E I combination, it's the last letter is the one that you hear. So if it's E I, you hear I. If it's I E, you hear the E. Believe it or not, it's I think it's the same in Dutch to an extent as well when it comes to uh, like yourself. You can speak uh, the old uh, German N lingo. I can speak a bit of the old Dutchy watchy lingo. So I think it's the same in Dutch as well. Although I haven't spoken that in God knows how long. Yeah, I never really, I, I didn't learn a ton when I was there. I mean, I learned a few things here and there enough to get by. But man, it's been so long since I've been there anyway. Well, I'm trying to pull G into chat, believe it or not, so he can unwittingly join this this conversation, so I can quite literally rip the living shit out of him for it. <laughs> so, Tommy, go on then. Update me onto the world of the internet, please, because I'd much rather hear it from the horse's mouth than the horse's ass. That is YouTube, please. What the hell's been going oh, on in the shit, land of dude. the lens? Come on, dude, what's going on? What's going on? If, if you want to hear that kind of stuff, you need to talk to G. He's the one that spends most of his time on the internet, dude. That's not well, me. That's why I'm trying to drag in, him into in chat. The, in the lands of the internet. Yeah, in the lands of the internet, or the interwebs, or, you know, the, the cat mind construct um, trying to control us all. <laughs> I uh, I haven't had enough time to spend there lately. Between oh, yeah, work got, running like, me like a madman. You've bloody sucks to run through, don't you? Yeah. Yeah, I just, between work being crazy and uh, the amount of work I've picked up on the podcast lately, <laughs> well, I haven't I had can, a lot of time can, to I just I feel guilty. I, won't, I want to cut you off there, Drac, because I enjoy cutting you off mid sentence because I know that annoys you. I, I do feel guilty about um, being sick, and I know I shouldn't, but I do. Uh, it's, it's, not, it's, 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 it's not right, Drac. It's not right. And I apologize. For being ill. No, you don't need to feel guilty about being sick, but that also doesn't mean I'm not going to give you crap about it. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I expect it. I've, I've come to learn that within our little, I'll say, motley crew, just just go with the flow, take it. Well, you know, part of that's probably how I grew up. Um, we kind of have a, an East Coast sense of humor. Most of my family's from the East Coast, and I, I don't know. I, a lot of my, a lot of the friends I've had growing up were usually from east coast even though i've met them all over the world but it, it just seemed like you know and i and i tell people this too it's like if i'm not making fun of you then it's because i don't care <laughs> there's a new thing in the uk called the sugar tax 
And it's like, yeah, oh, we're going to stop obesity by charging more for sugar. No, you're not. They're still going to eat the damn sugar. It's going to cost them more. They yeah, they were, yeah. I, I heard of places doing stuff like that. Like I think in New York City, they banned a certain size of uh, soft drink. Like you can't buy something larger than so many ounces. I yeah, think it a big was. gulp or something, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it just some of the crazy things they do. And it's like, okay, so people just go buy two. <laughs> well, there we go. Yeah, I mean, if somebody really wants that much, they're going to buy that much. But you no, know, no, yeah, there's yeah. a small percentage of people that, that you would actually have an effect on like that. But somebody who wants that is going to get it. <laughs> I, I don't stop it. I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm not going to stop it at all. If you want a two liter bottle of Coke, you are going to get a two liter bottle of Coke, whether it costs you two pound or two pound fifty. Yeah, you're going to get it. Hey, we're Light Loop Games talking about our new game on Kickstarter, Metal Shell Neon Pulse on Bamster's Rated R Podcast. Hello guys and welcome to this week's interview. Today, joining me as co-host is Draconis. We also have two guests with us today, guys. Uh, a Dan and a Seth. And uh, yes, they are coming along to talk to us about their game that is uh, on the old Kickstarters. So yes, Drac, introduce yourself and introduce the guests. Hello. Wait a minute. That doesn't work if I don't actually get them to, to agree to do this ahead of time. I was thinking like a Three Stooges kind of introduction. <laughs> no, no, no. no. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no. Um, so you guys, are, you guys are here from Light Loop Games to talk about Metal Shell Neon Pulse. Why don't you say hi and uh, give us a brief introduction to the game? Sure. Uh, I'm Seth Roll, uh, the lead project lead and uh, programmer. I'm Dan Barada, and I'm a game designer and effects artist. Uh, so, Metal Shell Neon Pulse is a 2D 80s inspired, uh, futuristic 80s uh, run and gun game where players pilot upgradable mechs in a battle to save Earth from an alien invasion. Uh, uh, similar to Contra and other games, uh, 2D games like that, uh, and we wanted to really make it feel like an old school like Super Nintendo game. You know, just pretty hard and unforgiving, but at the same time let players play through the whole thing where are you guys uh, in the world and how many people make up your team sure uh, so i'm li currently living in north carolina originally from maine dan dan lives in pennsylvania um and we have currently about s six other developers and a few marketing people uh they're literally all over the world so we've got uh one of our artists is here locally near me in north carolina We've got our composer who's in South Carolina. Um, we've got one of our artists in Denmark, an animator in California, uh, so on and so forth. There's, there's quite a few of us spread out everywhere. That's cool. That's kind of similar to our crew. We've got, got guys on the east and west coast of the U.S. and a couple different places in Europe. So uh, I'm, I'm wondering, I'm, or at least I'm assuming you guys probably run into some of the similar uh, scheduling conundrums that we run into from time to time because of that time difference absolutely it's been pretty difficult uh all of our marketing team seems to be in london uh uk time so like uh just trying to get a hold of them and getting meetings together he's kind of forced to flip back over to east coast time and it's, it's definitely painful for him uh not so much me he's kind of catering to me a little bit <laughs> guys why call yourselves Light Loop Games? Must say, that's a bit uh, oddballish. Why the name? Uh, so, I had this idea for, like, just an infinity symbol as, a, as kind of a game logo, uh, or a company logo. And I, I really wanted something to do with a loop, because, you know, that's kind of one of the basics of programming, looping. Uh, so, just kind of... It kind of just came about, you know, uh, after a lot of Googling and making sure nobody else had it. Uh, that's that's what I came up with. Um, as soon as I registered the company, somebody bought lightloopgames.com. <laughs> so right out from under me. So, you know, that, that kind of was pretty terrible. I, I won't lie. When I Googled LLG, you know, it came up with wheelchairs, bro. So I'm like, okay, I best ask this question. You're not basing yourself after like a wheelchair or something, right? <laughs> No, it's, it was mostly about loops and uh, infinity symbol. Happy days, happy days. So, Metal Shell Neon Pulse. 
I won't lie, dude. I've played a game similar to that before. Uh, it, I really enjoyed the game. Uh, you might have heard of a little character called a Robocop. It reminds me of that a lot. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, so a lot of the inspiration came from Contra and other 80s style games. So um, Robocop was one game I played a lot uh, when I was a kid. Uh, there, we had this our old school arcade game called Time Cop, and that was definitely a huge influence for it. Um, and my grandmother had that in her basement. My, my uncle rigged it up for uh, pressing buttons to act as a, inserting a quarter or whatever. It was great. <laughs> so we could just play forever. It would always win. <laughs> You could never lose. It was great. Uh, so a, a lot of those games were a huge inspiration for us uh, behind this. Uh, and, you know, we just really wanted it to, to seem similar to Contra and other games like that. I don't see a problem with that at all. I really enjoyed Robocop 2. You know, that was the best NES game in my opinion. I'm probably wrong in that opinion, but I really, really enjoyed that game. So tell me, how did you guys get into making games? Yeah, you want to answer one? <laughs> yeah. One. <laughs> um, <clears throat> uh, for me personally, I had been into music um, for a really long time when I was younger. Uh, I was a DJ for 10 years. Uh, I thought I wanted to be in the music industry, and it turns out the music industry is not something I'm cut out for. It's a little bit of a bitter place, uh, but I knew I still wanted to be a creator. So I decided, well, I started. Uh, you know, I've always been a gamer, and uh, started looking up online like what it takes to make games and how you go about, you know, just generally putting a game together. And it's it was way more complex than I had ever imagined. And um, <clears throat> I thought, like, yeah, you know, let me try my hand at this. And, you know, I, I downloaded Unity. I uh, started just like making some little basic levels and stuff, and uh, got to a point where I decided I wanted to go to school for it. Uh, so I ended up going to school, uh, met Seth at graduation, and that's how we linked up to start this project. Yeah, it was pretty similar for me, too, actually. Uh, I've always wanted to make games since I was little. Uh, I think Final Fantasy VII was the inspiration behind it all. Um, and I pumped for the remake. Uh, let's see. So I wanted to go to Full Sail after graduating uh, high school, but I could not afford it, so ended up joining the Air Force, and they paid for it, uh, every penny, luckily. So that was the only way I was able to go. Uh, and, and I definitely I put in the extra work so that I could come out on top. Well, I wanted to ask a little bit about the art direction and, and art style. You know, where, what kind of uh, was how that came about, what the inspiration was it for. You mentioned that there's upgradable mechs, so do you use, does the... Uh, character icon on the screen did that change over time yeah yeah so um armored core was was one of the other games that was a huge inspiration for this and so we want the characters to be able to have weapons um body parts and just uh, generally each little piece of them being able to be swapped out right so arms legs all that um so the the art style itself uh started from an actual, <laughs> it was actually started at a Ludum Dare uh, that Dan and I participated in. Uh, Ludum Dare, was that 39, Dan? Uh, it was 38 or 39, one or the other. Yeah, so just um, probably almost a year ago now, I think. Uh, a lot of what we did there kind of transitioned over. Uh, that Ludum Dare, if you don't know, is a, a game jam where you make a game in 72 hours uh, under some sort of theme. And it was it was a great time. We had a lot of fun. Uh, what we built is actually still available on itch uh, itch.io. Uh, but the art itself, we we kind of took inspiration from Voltron, um, kind of older cartoony stuff. It, at first, it came off a little goofy, uh, and it, it kind of got a little bit more polished from there. Um, and then we also we brought in a newer artist, uh, Ryan, and he. He had a unique style that I thought would work for the background and the props, mostly because it would uh, very, very much contrast from the foreground and the playable, movable characters. Yeah, I like the way that the character looks. Um, I had a chance to check out the demo a little bit and uh, play through that first level. So I, I'm liking what I see so far. It looks pretty cool. Awesome. Thanks. Um, and We're then happy Dan, to hear that. 
Yeah, definitely. Dan, I don't know if you want to talk about the visual effects at all. That's kind of your thing. Uh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> kind of got uh, self-assigned to the effects artist role in this project. Uh, it was needed. <laughs> I have had a little bit of experience prior to this game uh, doing effects art, but nothing too serious. Um, but just doing the effects art for this game has been a lot of fun. I've uh, been creating a lot of unique explosions and um, just like different uh, mechanical effects. Uh, when you beat the boss, there's uh, an explosion sequence followed by a lot of like spark showers and uh, the legs and some of the body parts have like uh, light, uh, electricity flowing uh, across the outside of the uh, boss when it's dead, and uh, that that was something that was kind of new to me, uh, making effects like that. And uh, someone at EGCG gave a compliment that said it reminded them of uh, Horizon Zero Dawn. Yeah, there you go. Oh yeah, that's a nice compliment. <laughs> yeah, I, I took it as uh, quite the uh, enthusiastic compliment. Are you doing any of the sound effects as well? Uh, no. You would not want me doing that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we had we had tried to scrape together some of our sounds and uh, by ourselves, and it just sounded bad. <clears throat> and uh, we had done the sound. Uh, I think we did the sound effects for the Ludum Dare game, if I'm not mistaken, and they were kind of goofy and didn't really fit. Um, I spoke to a sound designer recently. She was talking about, um, like, well, you know, what kind of sounds do you want, or what kind of theme of sounds do you want this to fit? And I was like, I don't know what you mean by that. <laughs> I'm not a sound designer. <laughs> it would be cool if I, uh, I knew a bit about it, but uh, maybe in the next lifetime. Oh, well, so far, I think whoever you found to do it has been doing a pretty cool job because just the, the sound effect for the walking, um, has a nice real you know thump to it uh that was, that was one of the things that, that kind of surprised me but that i thought was really cool was you know even just running around you get a nice little thump that you kind of it feels um you kind of feel that thump <laughs> yeah the mech feels heavy when you hear it walk uh that was actually one of the things we've struggled with with our um because there's a, a scale difference from what makes a game like interesting like being able to play it and have stuff feel right and look right is completely different so like the the crates in normal human size would be like buildings basically but the the mechs to them they're just little crates uh it's it's a difficult little thing to get by really um and what we have with the art is where we're at right now um I'd love to be able to change it or whatever, but that's what the, the Kickstarter's for. Well, let me ask then, how big are these these mechs then? Because I, I guess just looking at it and from the name, um, I had assumed that these were, uh, you know, maybe on the scale of like an Iron Man suit of armor, or maybe a little bit larger than that, but you're making it sound like they're much larger. Oh, yeah, no, they're, they're supposed to be, you know, like Voltron sized, right? So you've got um, like one player, the, the playable character. Uh, that's one thing that we have as like a stretch goal kind of we want to make the human pilots playable uh but that's where the scale issue came into play so we were thinking zoom in the camera but then the enemies are just you know massive so we'd probably have to have a whole new set of enemies it just wasn't in the budget for the demo to give a comparison on the scale size um if you look at the mech standing next to one of the street lights that we have in the level uh they're it's almost as tall as a streetlight. So your person easily fits inside the chest of the mech. And here's me thinking you guys are going sort of like, because you said Metal Shell, and we all know Metal Gear Solid, and we all know, you know, Evangelion. You know, here's me thinking these mechs were sort of Evangelion sort of size, you know? Multi, double story, triple story building size. Yeah, they're somewhere in the middle. There's something suitable that the three heroes could actually get in and go and fix some alien butt. Fair enough. I just want to um, pull back, pull you guys back a touch. I believe it was uh, what was it? Dan mentioned that he has um, he's got set of explosion sequences. Now, if he's drawing from 80s explosions, you know films like Rambo, 
diehard, all those sorts of films, they're pretty freaking awesome explosions, you know. As for the video games, you know, I particularly remember Metal Slug explosions. Are you guys going for that sort of explosion sequence, or are you going to go for more of a 90s thing, like a Sonic the Hedgehog sort of Sega type explosion when he defeats the boss and it kind of explodes and you go free all the bunny rabbits from their cages and monsters? Uh, that's kind of what we have going on at the moment. Uh, I would like to expand on that in the future. I'm thinking more uh, large mushroom cloudy type things, uh, although creating that uh, at the current time wasn't realistic. So I did what I could, um, and I'm you know learning about um, like the physics of what makes mushroom clouds look the way they do now, and how to translate that into uh, uh, editing the software so that I can actually put that as a, an effect. Yeah, a lot of physics behind that. A lot of physics behind mushroom clouds. I wait. I I, I gotta go back a second. Bam! Save the bunny rabbit. Where well, you know, from? at the end of Son of the Hedgehog, right? You defeat that that weirdy beardy dude looks like an eggshell, right? And you gotta jump on a stupid freaking silver gray thing with a yellow button, and that all the rabbits and chipmunks and things that jump out of it, and that's the <laughs> stage ever. That's what I remember from playing um, Sonic and Tails and Sonic and stuff. Okay, because you were talking like 80s movies and Rambo and all that stuff, and then you started saying something about Save the Bunny Rabbits, and the only one I could think of was Con Air with Nicolas Cage, and I'm like, you just got 80s and 90s mixed up. No, no, I'm <laughs> saying, I'm saying, look, yeah, you know, you, you're, you're, not, you're not wrong, right? There's there's the 80s sort of explosions, and then there's the 90s sort of explosions, you know, like Con Air and stuff. And don't get me wrong, the 90s explosions were good, but, you know, you're always thinking, you know, the 80s were just better, you know, the Rambos, the, the sort of, sort of um, Arnie Swanee sort of film. The explosions were freaking amazing, you know. So I just want to see which which side of the uh, the coin these boys were on. Were they going to go for the, you know, the Sonic the Hedgehog explosion, or were they going to go for the Metal Slug sort of explosion? I, I don't know why I brought movie references into it. I, I just <laughs> want to watch Die Hard, and, and I, I, I just want to watch Die Hard, right? It's a good film. Go watch Die Hard. It's a good film. Now I kind of want to see one of these mechs go, Put the bunny down. <laughs> Put down the bacon. <laughs> yeah, or the, or the think, bunny gets it. <laughs> I think what Dan was saying was pretty accurate. Um, right now, we we do have more of a. It's, it is a little bit like Metal Slug, right? That was even one of the games we looked to for references for the uh, for explosions. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, the, uh, a little bit of. Uh, explosions like happening like up and down like the boss's legs and kind of stuff like that and that's what i picture when you're talking about the sonic thing i i remember that pretty pretty well i've saved sorry, a lot sorry, of dude, I'm, I'm a i'm a bit of a weird geek so I, I remember certain things but other things couldn't tell you what where or how but i remember explosions because you know explosions are cool explosions are <laughs> dramatic explosions are epic it makes you feel like you've accomplished something you know, a good explosion makes Absolutely. you feel, you know, like you've eaten six rushes of bacon and had a pint of beer. A brilliant feeling, let me tell you. That's something that I was struggling with. Well, uh, especially with the uh, when you beat the boss, is that the explosion didn't really feel as meaningful as the fight. So, um, I mean, what we have now is it's it's, it's not bad, but um, it's definitely going to be elaborated on in uh, future renditions. So I uh, expect something much more dramatic when we update this. Brilliant. More explosions. You can't go wrong with a good explosion. You really can't. Okay, I- I'll stop talking about explosions. It's just, you know, I like explosions. We don't have say? to if you don't want to. I like explosions just as much as you. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Kindred spirit. Kindred spirit. Let's move into the mechanics of the game a little bit. Why don't you talk about how the game works, how you control the character, some of the different game mechanics options that you have, and you know, what it takes maybe to, to master those skills required to beat the game. Uh, sure. Uh, so a lot of what we have right now are uh, mobility type uh, mechanics. So we have like a dash and a slam. Though they get you places quick. That's their main goal, and they they double because they also do damage. Um, so the slam, it, say you've got like a missile coming at your face, you can slam down onto the ground and get away from it really quickly. Um, and you also do a little area of effect uh, damage when you slam, when you hit the ground. Uh, that can be used to dispatch enemies below you. Um, uh, the dash, we also have um, 
and we we've done some updates to it after getting some uh, first round of feedback from the Kickstarter, and we now have it so that you can let go of the button and your dash will come out. Of, you'll come out of the dash instead of like having a set distance for it. So it, that is actually it feels pretty smooth now. Um, you you can use that to also deal damage and avoid uh, getting hit by bullets but i mean you're a mech right you're this big huge metal monster so you can take some laser blast to the to the dome and be fine so so the the basic mechanics is you know dodging bullets and and killing enemies but which is kind of funny um <clears throat> watching people play the game uh we've recently been at two different conventions where we've had uh, a table set up and just standing behind people watching them play there's a lot of people that don't want to get hit at all. Uh, so it's a difficult message to convey to not really a mechanic, but the dynamic behind that is that you can take a lot of damage. You can go, you can, you can 1v1 all the characters that we currently have within the level um, and still be, you know, relatively okay. Um, <clears throat> picking up armor pieces or picking up scrap metal that the enemies drop when they die is what recharges your armor. So um, we need to find a more effective way to get people to take damage and be okay with it, I guess you could say. That was something I noticed when I was playing the demo, is it almost seemed like it was... It, uh, how do I want to describe this? It, it felt almost like wasted effort trying to avoid every shot, just because it, you spent so much time dodging and you weren't able to fire back that it just it felt more efficient to just take a few hits to get the hits in that you needed to take them down right and um there's a, like well there's a lot of bullets on screen at once and um we thought maybe like that would convey the message like hey you're gonna get shot deal with it um but you know uh not always the case yeah it's definitely a work in progress so we're always open to, to feedback and we're tweaking things as we go um so one of the things that we talked about was having it be like Contra. Contra is an extremely difficult game. Um, it's extremely unforgiving. You get hit, you're, you're pretty much done, right? Like one, two, three, three hits, game over. Um, so in our game, we actually wanted players to keep going since this isn't the 80s where they're trying to get you to feed in quarters every two seconds <laughs> into an arcade machine. But uh, so we, we wanted help and a, a good amount of it uh, and that just gives players you know the ability to take some take some hits and keep going I'd say that makes sense and then well in the demo too with the tutorial it walks you through how to play the game using keyboard and mouse are you guys do you already have controller support built in is that something you're looking at yeah it's it actually lets you uh, swap between uh, dynamically so say you were playing with keyboard when you started you can just grab a controller and it'll detect it and swap to it the tutorial text should change too. Oh, okay, nice. And and with keyboard and mouse, are you guys planning to put in options to remap all the keys or, or no? Yep, that's already built in. It should be mostly working. Um, it needs a GUI update, but other than that, it's uh, it's just, like, good to go. No foot pedals, boys, by any chance. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, have you played the game Steel Battalion? No, heard of no, it. no, no. Oh man, so that's another huge mech game. Um, the first time I saw it was on original Xbox. Can't call it Xbox One now. Um, so they uh, they had this huge console that you sit in front of you. It's not even a keyboard. It's it's beyond a keyboard, right? Like it's this giant metal console, and it's got all kinds of buttons and switches and like all these different toggle things to hit. You've got a couple joysticks, kind of like a light yoke thing, um, and a set of pedals. And you just go to town, like, pressing stuff to control your mech. There's even, like, a windshield wiper button. Um, and that game was also a little bit of inspiration behind this. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't go as crazy. I, I can't sell people a giant metal mech con controller thing, <laughs> but um, that would be quite interesting. Just to, just to uh, again, call back what you guys said earlier on. You guys have been to two previous conventions. Uh, which conventions were they? Yeah, so in North Carolina here locally, I live in uh, Durham, which is very close to Raleigh, and they have at their convention center quite a bit going on for game devs. Uh, 
I'm just down the street from Epic Games, so they're they're always hosting different events and whatnot. Um, so East Coast Game Convention was the most recent one, and we had a little booth set up there where players could come by and check it out. And then previously we had one at the same location um, called Playthrough Game Convention, and those guys are great. Um, it's it's newish, but it's growing like crazy. Uh, the East Coast Game Convention is more for developers than it is for uh, other bands and whatnot. Okay, so are you guys planning to go to any more conventions this year? Uh, possibly. You know, it kind of depends on how the Kickstarter goes, really. Um, I've spent quite a bit of money on the funding the where we're at today, so I, I don't really want to put too much more into it without... Uh, I can't really without uh, going broke, so um, it depends. You know, I would love to go down to uh, there's there's another convention called Terminus in Georgia. It's uh, more of a film festival, but they also have a gaming side, and that's something I've I actually entered Metal Shell Neon Pulse into their competition. So I'm hoping to uh, get some feedback from them, and hopefully, you know, if we we get nominated for the competition, then. Uh, They'll actually give us a booth down there, so we could end up there. That's in mid-July, I believe. Brilliant. Happy days. So you do have plans for the future for this game. Brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah. Absolutely. We, yeah, we've definitely got much more designed than we have developed, so uh, the future of the game does rely on funding, but um, <clears throat> I think me and Seth will probably continue working on at least something related to this project, even if it doesn't get funded. Definitely. We'll keep pushing out updates, so the demo will get quite a bit more complicated as, as we go. I was going to say, depending on how the Kickstarter goes, if it doesn't go through, uh, we've seen a couple of different um, games where you know they reorganize, uh, restructure things, and then come back later, uh, whether it's um, you know doing more community outreach or uh, you know changing their target goal or even... even changing the goalpost from full release to, you know, the Kickstarter gets into like early access in Steam. So there's a few different options there if, if the Kickstarter doesn't work out this time around. Yeah, we're hopeful about the, uh, the future of this game. Um, it's been a great time making it so far. We've been doing it for about eight or nine months. And it's, you know, it's, uh, it's a lot of work, but it's also a lot of fun. So why don't you guys tell us a little bit about uh, like the story, the backstory of the game, and, and where these metal suits or shells came from, or like how they were developed? Ah, question for Dan. Got it. Um, <clears throat> so this is far off in the future. Um, we're looking at the year 2684. Uh, so we're, you know, technology's advanced quite a bit. Um, Humans have colonized Mars because we've used up too many resources on Earth, and Earth is starting to deteriorate. Um, and an alien race has run into a very similar problem, but at a accelerated. Uh, so they've already left their planet, and they're coming to take ours. Uh, and that sounds, I guess, somewhat generic now that I'm saying that out loud. Dang. <laughs> <laughs> um... <clears throat> So your characters are uh, three military background people, uh, Phoenix, Jack, and Maddox, who have all been recruited to be a, uh, on a special operative team uh, in order to take out these aliens. And um, hmm. I don't want to give away too much of this story, but uh, yeah, um, you will fight on Earth, you will fight on Mars, and you will fight eventually on the mothership, uh, the alien mothership, I should say. So I don't get to fight on um, Phobos. Can you repeat that? I don't get to fight on Phobos. Phobos? <laughs> no, Phobos. P H O B O S. It's uh, the, the little moon that orbits oh, oh. Mars. No, no. Uh, it's like a big ass so. asteroid, really. It's like a, it's yeah. Like a, it's like someone's taken a potato and just stuck it next to the planet. You know, like a deformed potato. There we go. <laughs> Uh, that's not something we've thought of, but, you know, we're, we're open to suggestions uh, to make this more creative. Yeah, like a base before Mars, and like a little mini battle before Mars. Uh, uh, all I can say is, Destiny did it. <laughs> Look how great that game is. <laughs> Maybe one day we'll be that great. I'm hoping for it. And Pam didn't really mean that as a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> he's, Throwing he's a little not shade. A huge fan of 
Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, the, the soul to stick with this one. Uh, it's yeah. It's uh, for you guys. I thought it would be a great idea to have like little, little like you know, mini battle, mini boss battle before entering into the the whole Martian environment. You go from Earth to the Moon, then to Phobos, and then down to the Mars, like a like a mini sort of pathway sort of thing before you do like the main battles just to give you some more content whatever but then as I was as you said as you was talking it out loud the the company did it before was Destiny you know the Bungies and look look how well they're, they're doing with their content yay <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you no, know what? every story is recycled from a previous story in one way or another uh, and I was just thinking it would be a great idea but I'm thinking yourself again you know wait wait Destiny did it Bungie did it. No, no, never mind. Shut up, Bam. You don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Drunk yeah. knew what I was talking about. Unfortunately, uh, you poor souls haven't come across me yet, so uh, you guys are you're lots to learn. Lots to learn. All right. Well, you did um, speak about mini bosses, uh, and that is something that we do have planned for the game. So uh, before you before you get to the boss level, uh, there's going to be mini bosses mini boss fights that you'll go through and uh we had a couple unique ways of mapping these levels um we were discussing how we could uh utilize this story in a very creative way um since the concept of it isn't all that original uh we went we wanted to um hopefully get like a uh, parallel timeline going on for each of the characters or uh, something that would be uh, unique to the story. Um, we were discussing creating a uh, alien language that you could decrypt and share between the three characters in order to gain more intel on how to beat these aliens. Um, so uh, story-wise, we have... We have a lot of open options uh, for how to make a not-so-unique story much more engaging to the player. Well, you see, you could go to like a, another planet, for example, Venus. You know, I take it you guys are aware that Venus is the hottest planet within our solar system. Sure. Okay, yeah. so it's not Mercury, believe it or not, the one that's quite literally sitting on the ball sack of the sun. It's not that one <laughs> that you would have thought of. It's actually Venus. You know, huge clouds of sulfuric acid, you know, massive iron core, you know, a lot more resources would be on that than, say, Mars, because, you know, Venus is a lot bigger than Mars, if my memory serves me right. So, you know, maybe fighting in a dark, gloomy, dead death cloud type, acidy rain type place would have to take a pass on Venus, you know, shit, there's so much you can do within the solar system, really, there is so much you can do. Absolutely, yeah, and there's, there's no real end to where we can go, uh with the storyline um you know destiny is focused on their gameplay and not so much on the story but um ours is kind of like a in the middle somewhere so we we have um like our our pop-up text that we have set up uh it kind of lists you through the story and we're hoping to have voice voiceovers for it so each each person has their own uh unique little actor or whatever and they can t help tell the story Brilliant. And there's Brilliant. yeah, there's there's really no end to where we can go. Um, you know, we do have an end in mind, of course, and that ends on the the alien mothership. Uh, and you end up fighting the the hive mind, which is like controlling all of these crazy aliens. Dude, that is so contra. That is last level boss contra action right there. I really yes. really enjoyed that. That is so contra. Ah, oh, love it, love it. Yeah, and so we've been kind of working on the design, like off the in the background where nobody can see it because we don't have the art for it. But <laughs> but you know, it's uh, it's coming along, and it's something we definitely want to be able to bring to players. Happy days, happy days. Which platforms are you guys going to be releasing this game on? So currently, we're only targeting PC. Um, one of our stretch goals is to get it out on Xbox, but that's an expensive endeavor. So as an indie. We also have the option for ID at Xbox. We, we could go that route as well. Um, probably just need to bring on another programmer to help us port it over if we get the funding. Believe it or not, a lot of people, because of um, you know making games for essentially the Windows systems, right, are finding it a lot easier to go the Xbox route. And I think this is what Xbox 
had planned to do all along, believe it or not. Um, basically, undermine Steam, undermine PlayStation. Essentially, you develop a game for Windows, you go via the ID dot whatever system, whatever have you, and you can essentially launch it on Xbox via their um, indie games. And I tell you what, a brilliant spark of a genius idea. You know, lovely because they will under they will undermine Sony and their endeavors to get. Um, in the developers on their console. I'm actually talking to some good Swedish friends of mine who actually launched the game on the PS4. Uh, didn't launch it on Xbox, but now because of this whole Xbox One share play nonsense that, you know, Microsoft are doing, the Great next thing. game they're going to be doing is uh, coming out on Xbox One first and PC and PlayStation 4 gets it last. Very, very clever way of, of, of uh, basically undermining PS4 in the way... But you know, in a roundabout way, and how they've done it—very clever, ingenious. Absolutely, and I mean, it's it's a little bit more cost-effective too. I mean, oh the, yes, definitely, the... definitely. I mean, I I don't hold it against you for going Xbox One, being a PS4 player, because to be honest, it makes business sense. It's it's logical sense, right? How do I get my game in the hands of as many people as possible as quick as possible? Exactly. Windows, Xbox. There we go. Done. And then from that, I can then take the resources, whatever have you, and then push it over to PS4. Again, still an expensive um, endeavor, but at least you can do it once those resources have been obtained. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I mean, I can even turn my, my Xbox One sitting on the shelf over here into a dev kit. So uh, Microsoft really, like you said, they, they've definitely nailed the indie market for that. Yeah, now, they have. Nintendo Switch is definitely doing well too on the indie oh. <laughs> oh no. Oh, oh. Fuck it. Okay, right. I'm done. There. I'm done. I'm done. I'm fucking done. I'm done. <laughs> that's not a console, dude. That's a tablet, right? That is not a console. You you can't you can't even call that a console, dude. If you want to call it a console, I might as well take my PS4 and call it a PC. You, you know, it kind of is. <laughs> yeah, minus it's, minus it's, the software but, running on it. It's a, you know, it's Sam's a not wrong, bro. but but here's what's funny. He he likes to call me a PC PC master racer, and he'll refer to himself at times as a console peasant. But I don't know. <laughs> he's got his nose pretty far up in the air when it comes to Nintendo. <laughs> well, I mean, I guess I can kind of understand that mentality. I bought a uh, Wii U. And it collects dust in my You mean a PU, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh... I don't know. They nickel and dime you for everything, and I didn't appreciate that too much. So I kind of just, like... And I, I mean, the games are fun or whatever. Mario is cool. But you can only put Mario into so many games until you kind of get bored of it. And you can only buy so many add-ons to your console until you go flat broke. Believe it or not, I, I do agree with you there. I really do. When I had a NES and then a SNES, right? I love those. I love the games. I played them to the deaths, right? I would stay up late at night. I, I would get in trouble. I would not do home. I'd do all the things that I'm sure everyone else here has done, you know, just so I could play Mario. You know, uh, shit. At one time, I went across to, um, um, good God, Sega to play. Um, Sonic and Tails and whatever. I love video games. I really do. But lately, when it came to the the Wii and the Wii U, and it just feels I don't know, false and pretentious. I, I don't. Okay, granted, the, the 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 wavy sticky thing was great, but you know, again, like you said, Mario. Fuck uh, yeah! How many times are going to rehash Mario? How, how many times? Lots. Too many. Lots times. and lots. Uh, too many times. Too many times. But yeah, I, as I've said to to um. To, uh, my good friend Draconis, Nintendo doesn't sell games. They sell you nostalgia. That's all they're selling you because they're they're banking on the fact that because you played video games in the 80s, you will then buy a video game in 2018 because it has the same name, Mario, or so on and so forth. So yeah, you know, I'm a bit jaded by that, you know. Oh, I think that was a lot of the idea behind uh, Mario Maker. I bought Mario Maker well after it had released, but uh, apparently it was really bare bones when it first came out until people made content for it. So I, I, I definitely see where you're coming from on, with that mentality. Um, is it the best business model? Uh, I mean, they're selling games, but at the same time, are they kind of pissing people off a little bit? Like, uh, like you, you sold a bunch of people somewhat of an empty game. 
and just said like, "Hey, make your own." That's that's true. That's true. Speaking about uh, consoles, right? Since we're on that topic now, um, what platforms do you want to release this game on, and what platforms do you hope to release this game on? Well, the Xbox is. Um, and don't say, "Oh yeah, please." Oh console. my god. Um, <laughs> I, I would like to release it on PlayStation. Uh, I've been a PlayStation guy since I was little. Uh, PlayStation One. PlayStation 2, uh, so, you know, Sony, Sony's my deal, uh, when I'm not playing games on the computer. Uh, but I know Seth is kind of the opposite end of that, he is more of a Microsoft Xbox guy, uh, and don't get me wrong, I don't dislike Xbox, I have an Xbox too, I just don't own as many games for it. But, uh, I think it really comes down to, uh, what's going to be cost-effective, and, uh, what's going to be profitable. Uh, we need to research and find out what's going to help us market our game the best and uh, make our game available to the most people. Again, business head when it comes to that. So, guys, as I already know the the answer to this question, as does Drake, if anybody here wants to get in touch with you, get into um, to the Kickstarter and support you guys, uh, what's... Uh, Platforms are you guys on? You know the Twitters, the Discords, the forums, the Twitches, all that bits and pieces. What platforms are you guys on? Yeah, so we've got, like you said, we've got Discord. Uh, that's that's the best way, uh, and we we're on there constantly, all day, every day, pretty much. And you can chat with us live time. So that's the best way. Uh, Twitter is next, and then Instagram and Facebook. Uh, most of those eggs are uh, at Light Loot Games. You can find us. So, um, and then we also have a, a website. Uh, it has a forum on it, but I just built it, and it's just bare bones at the moment. So, if people want to post, they can. <laughs> people should post. If you're listening to this, you should hop on there and go talk to us on our forum. And we'll make sure we get all those links in the description on the website and on the uh, YouTube video once that goes live. I believe so. I think we're, uh, we're we're running up towards the end of the hour here, so we're going to ask you guys same question we like to ask all of our guests. It's a, a non-gaming related question, but uh, it's a theme that has followed through uh, every episode that we've had where we get a chance to interview someone, and that is, what kind of bacon do you like, how do you like it prepared, and what kind of beverage, be it beer, cider, uh, whiskey, or et cetera, would you pair with said bacon? Oh my god. Um... Candied bacon, for sure. I don't know if you guys have ever seen Epic Meal Time, but yeah, um, candy bacon is amazing. You got baked, uh, baked in the oven with brown sugar. Uh, it just melts in your mouth. It's amazing, and the perfect alcoholic drink to go with that is rum and coke, for sure. That's all this guy drinks is rum and coke. It's disgusting. Hey man, <laughs> it's amazing. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I was but a pirate I, I, in I, another I, life. I'm sorry, but cider for me is is king. But rum and coke, I, I do have the odd tipple when I'm out on the lash with the lads. I couldn't drink it all the time. Mm. I do like uh, a nice crispy, thick cut bacon, and not thick cut like Oscar Mayer thick cut. Thick cut from the butcher, where it's like uh, you know, like an eighth inch thick, something that actually has like uh, some weight to it. You know, like all right, you know when you go to the store and you pick up a pack of bacon. And you get home, and you're all ready to cook it, and then you throw it in the pan, and it burns within 15 seconds because it's, you know, it's so thin you can see through it. It's just such a disappointing feel. You can't cook it nice and crispy without it getting charred. It's got to be thick, and it's got to have black pepper on it. Really? Pepper. I don't know about pairing it with a drink. Uh, all I drink is water. That's it. Good old water. I'm just shocked people in America land can buy bacon that you can see through. What 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 land is this that I've just suddenly heard of? What the hell are you talking about? Bacon you can see through? Cheap corporation land. No, no bollocks. You can't have bacon that you can it see through. It is bollocks. I do I do <laughs> concur. It is bollocks. That's that's, that's uh, just terrible. It is terrible. It's a damn sin. It's a travesty is what it is. How how can you buy bacon that's see through? Bro, that's not bacon. It's not like yeah, you, you know, like you get some of this cheap bacon, and I don't know where what it's what it costs over there, but um, bacon's crazy expensive in the United States. 
pack of bacon is probably like uh, between six and eight dollars. So, you know, and it doesn't. It's not like you can just fill up on bacon. You know, well, you could, but you'd go broke. <laughs> Dude, but, uh, seriously, you need to come to the land of the free and the home of the bacon. Come to Europe, where bacon is served at, at nice cheap rates, yeah? And, and alcohol is, is everyone's wet dream. Come, come to <laughs> Europe land, right? No, whatever lie, dude, seriously, bacon is is dirt cheap here. No, whatever lie, you can get uh, three packs of, was it, 48 rashes, right? Three of those packs for five pounds. What the hell land are you live in that bacon costs six bucks per pack, bro? Uh, Holy I, shit. I don't know what those units no, of measurements are, right. but I imagine that's a lot of bacon for a little bit of money. Well, if you think about it, mate, five pounds is about ten bucks, but you've now quite literally got yourself 150 rashes of bacon. Not not like cheap bacon, good bacon, because all bacon is good. Whether it's see-through or not, you still get bacon in your bacon's good. I'm not denying that. But, you know, uh, you have a rasher of bacon and it's, it's like delicious bacon. Mm. Rashes are slices, I take it. Well, you be able to talk, that's what you call a bacon rasher. In, in America land, you, there's a different cuts of bacon compared to Europe land. Europe land has, um, I think it's a back bacon, where it's more like um, a medallion with a bit of fat on it. Whereas um, in the land of uh, Yank land, I think it's a uh, belly fat. Which is then belly bacon, so it's like a like a like a longitudinal slab, a little bit of a you know fat meat fat sort of thing, which is yeah, still bacon, but it's delicious. A lot of our bacon, like from the grocery store, is pretty fatty. Uh, if you go to the butcher, though, you know they'll give you the good stuff. But we have a uh, declining number of butcher shops over here. I, I just have to rewind real quick to something Bam said about all bacon being good bacon. That that sounds all well and good, but turkey bacon is not oh, oh, in that right, category. Okay, right. <laughs> oh, I, I must help you there. I, I, help you. I agree there, right, right. This this fallacy that turkey actually has bacon is bullshit. Bollocks, I call right there. Granted, you know, you can get the health freak say, right, turkey bacon is turkey bacon. No, dude, it's just a finely cut turkey breast. Uh, I, w I was intrigued to hear about this thing called turkey bacon from a couple of people uh, who we interviewed a couple of times, right? A few people popped up, oh, I like turkey bacon. No, 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 It's just turkey. There's no bacon, it's just turkey. That's all it is, dude. Turkey cut to a, a fine strip. That's yep. it. Essentially, that's all it is. It's just turkey. And I, I, I won't lie, I went to the store and I bought myself some turkey bacon. And I'm like, yeah, I'm just eating turkey. I, I'm, I'm going to have to educate you people into realizing what real bacon is. Well, know. turkey bacon wouldn't be so bad if one, they would just brand it as what it is. Strips of turkey. Turkey and strips, secondly, yep. it needs to be able to crisp. You cannot crisp up turkey bacon. That, that's a oh, you can, you can. Now you see, if you wrap a turkey breast in bacon, that I have no problems with that. You see, that <laughs> okay. to me is turkey bacon, bro. <laughs> I'm on board what, with that. What are we? What are we going to call it? A tur bacon? <laughs> tur bacon. There we go. Tur bacon done. Well, all right, guys. Uh, for myself, I want to thank you for joining us today, and I want to wish you the best of luck with the Kickstarter and see how that goes. But uh, it definitely, I had some fun with the demo. Um, I'm going to go back and, and play around with it a little bit more, and, and uh, I really do enjoy the art style. I like the way the game looks. So uh, thanks again for coming on. Awesome. We're glad to hear that you like it. Thank you very much for coming along to chat to us today about your game and your Kickstarter. Folks, please go along and have a look-see at uh, these guys' a little contribution to the gaming world. It's a lot of fun. Again, it reminds me of, of, of Robocop 2. You know, I really enjoyed the game on my NES, and if they say the last boss is going to be a Contra star boss, I'm, I'm all over it like, like turkey wrapped bacon. No, wait, wait. Bacon wrapped turkey. <laughs> What? Turbacon. Turbacon. You're Turbacon. trying to ruin your bacon I, by wrapping it in turkey. I, I know. I, I don't know why I said it. I don't know why. I'm going to hang my head to shame. 